Folks, every once in a while, I have a guest on this show that I absolutely, positively am over the hill excited to talk to. And tonight is one of those times because with me is the star of, I'm going to call it a cult classic, Bloody Bridget. But she is uh, doing just a number of really rad things in the horror community um, things that actually we uh, have done here in Northern California, trying to build horror communities, live screenings, live shows, all kinds of fun stuff. And she is here to talk about all of it with us. Mrs. Anastasia Elfman, how are you doing today? I'm doing wonderful. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. So... First and foremost, man, and you can pass this along to Richard as well, but congratulations on the reception. The last time you guys came on, it was like, I want to say like maybe a month to a month and a half out of you guys dropping Bloody Bridget. So you were really excited. You had you know, begun principal and you were like rolling along and feeling good about it. And then, bam, there it was. It's a Dope. If you guys don't know, uh, Anastasia plays Bridget, who's like a burlesque dancer who terribly mistreated and through a series of events channels the powers of what is, I guess I'll compare it to like uh, uh, from dust till dawn style transformation. And she <laughs> uses this power to literally rip apart all the dicks that happen to come see her, <laughs> come to see her. And it results in a bloody damn good time that has that Elfman stamp all over it. But man, what, what fun that movie had to have been. Oh my God. So fun. So fun. I mean, I'm so lucky. Ricky, uh, my husband, Richard, he sets the standard on set for just having fun and getting work done. Like he, he shoots so fast. Him and uh, our DP, Howard Wexler, they work, they they have like this unspeakable uh, kind of like bond and communication where they're just able to move so fast. And so that like raises the stakes for me to move and like create and act very fast. But I come from the stage, so I love an instant like gratification. I don't, I mean, I'll do it, but I don't love uh take after take after take it's like i like to get the performance out and then move on and i'm lucky that rick is that way as well so so we, we we're a good team creatively you know the, the coming from the stage i had my degree my first degree that i got when i was way younger was in theater Ooh. so that live audience instant gratification i totally relate to you because doing film there, that doesn't really exist. Like, I can remember the first time in film school and we had to, like, stage the scene and it was like, okay, we're done. There's no no applaud, no anything. It's help us pack up the equipment and let's move on to the next thing. And it did. It was a, it was a culture adjustment for sure. So you going into this movie you know with him with if, if you if you have seen you know richard's forbidden zones or just follow him on social media you know the dude <laughs> likes having fun so it's cool to see that he's able to bring that to set in the director's role as well yes yes i mean, I mean it's a very joyful set uh and you know, it, it, it's like everybody's focused on getting the work done. So that's great. Uh, but it's like, you know, we can be nice and we can have fun at the same time and get our work done, you know, which is great for me because it's like um, not only starring in the film and being in every single scene, I also like produce the film. So it's like I want everybody to have a good time and, you know, feel like, you know, they're getting their stuff out that they want to convey in their scenes and everything like that. But like, you know, time is money too. So I like a fun mixture of both, you know. Oh yeah, for sure. The But I totally agree with you with the culture shock. I mean, it's so 
crazy to me sometimes because I come, you know, I come from the stage and I'm also a classically trained uh, ballerina. So I'm a dancer as well. And so I'm all about like rehearsal and, you know, getting it down. And I find that a lot of times with like film actors, they do not want to rehearse. They just want to get the thing done. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Let's rehearse this. <laughs> Can we like plot it out a little? <laughs> yeah. But it's like, you know, you just got to bob and weave because everybody's instrument works differently. And that's just how I was, you know, brought up. For sure. For sure. <laughs> you guys are like, the the film is like having a heck of a successful festival circuit run. Like you guys seem like you're everywhere, man. We are. <laughs> We've been from, from the south, south of Brazil. I'm getting like an echo. Are you getting an echo? No, I'm not. No. Okay, <laughs> perfect. I'll, just, I'll, I'll ignore her. Um, <laughs> so we've been to the south of Brazil, to like the tip top of Canada and everywhere in between. And we've been taking this kind of like as a road show, uh, like an immersive experience where Ricky and I, a majority of the time, whenever it's screening, we'll travel with the film and put on a live uh, bloody burlesque show, like pre-show, where I literally rip the beating heart out of an unsuspecting uh, audience member. And Rick will sometimes get a band together. And so we like supporting the like local talent with that. And it's just like a wild experience. You know, we have a um, we have a film festival and like convention um, next month called, uh, what's it called? Dark Side, New Jersey. And so we're bringing that fun show to New Jersey. <laughs> and you, our, our mutual good friend, uh, Brian Jones from Vertical Talent Agency, you yes. ripped his heart out uh, last year. Yes, and, I did. And my, I ta my talent agent, you know, you, have you ever had that feeling of just like wanting to rip the heart out of your talent agent? I'm just kidding. He's <laughs> such a wonderful guy. And actually, he, he might have been, might be my favorite victim. He was so great, so great to work with, you know, on the stage and behind the scenes, too. He, he really takes care of us. Yeah, and we need Bridget to come rip the hearts out of some administrators at the school I teach at, Anastasia. Let's do it. <laughs> Let me know. <laughs> I'll pencil it in. <laughs> Happy to. <laughs> the thing that I think is really cool with you in particular is you are all about building like a horror community and doing different screenings and doing different things that just really kind of bring people together to celebrate the horror genre, whether it be new or old films. I know just in our conversations, you have a super deep appreciation for like classic horror, which is awesome. And you though have got something pretty rad coming up early next year. We actually just had Jeffrey Combs at Sinister Creature Con uh, last weekend. And he is the star of course, of Reanimator, and you are doing something super dope sounding for the 40th anniversary of that. Yes, yes. So I'm uh, Richard, my husband, and I are uh, really close friends with uh, Brian Usna, and he's having a wonderful, uh, huge um, celebration, the like 40th anniversary of Reanimator in Cannes at the Cannes Film Festival. And so he approached me uh, about uh, creating a new wild uh, burlesque number inspired by the film. And he wants me, I mean, I don't want to give too much away, but I'm going to be ripping a part of him off. It's going to be really crazy. And I'm hoping to get like, um, Je get Jeffrey Combs in on it, and then maybe if uh, Barbara Crampton is there, you know, like I, 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 I want to have like a huge performance and just sure. celebrate that wonderful film, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's sure. so iconic. For sure, man. the The film in itself is something that I have not really seen anything like since. Like the the imagery, while the concept 
may have been tried to be duplicated. I don't think anybody has has pulled it off since that that original as well as that original. That is a like true classic horror. If you you know come across this interview, whether it be video or audio, and you have not seen Reanimator, you need to watch Reanimator. Stop this right now, and that's your homework. Go watch Reanimator, and you'll understand why we love it so much. It's so it's so wild. <laughs> but that's kind of also what I do. I do these uh, kind of like very unique, immersive, uh, I say burlesque because there's a little bit of nudity, but it's not like, I love Dita Von Tees, but I don't do what she does. I'm very choreographed and very in your face and uh i'm pulling inspiration from the film and so i create these wild uh pre-show numbers based off of whatever film there that i'm doing like i have a howling one i have a suspiria one i do one mm. obviously for bloody bridget and uh we tour with my husband's film forbidden zone so i have one for that uh but and i also uh i'm forgetting <laughs> I've worked with like the Horowski family mm -hmm. and created one for uh, their like big anniversary in Mexico City uh, for Santa Sangre. And so I did a wild number for that where like my arms ripped off and I was in point shoes and it, it was it was crazy. But this is like one of my passions. I love, you know, bringing live performance back into the cinematic experience. That's like one of my huge goals is to do more of these films and expand it. And, you know, audiences love this kind of stuff. And I, you know, like I'm a live performer at heart. So it's fun for me. <laughs> it really takes me back to the, you know, like the Tingler days back when they used to like plant buzzers under the seats or uh, Vincent Price is haunting a, a Hill House uh, and they people were freaking out because they had skeletons on pulley systems that would fly over the top and everything completely i mean i like to say that the stuff that i'm doing it's kind of like a vaudeville s meets a william castle type of like hijinks you know like i i love to do this kind of stuff and people don't expect it because they're like okay it's a burlesque show whatever but like when i'm running at them with balloons and popping them in their face or like a fake knife or ripping out like we had a a la uh like screening kind of the la premiere for bloody bridget so i had uh brian Husna as my victim and so i literally ripped i disemboweled him and ripped out his heart so like people aren't expecting this like craziness because like there's actual like you know effects happening and and blood everywhere so it, it's a fun time <laughs> how much how much pre-prep do you guys like how much time do you guys have to stage it all because I know Brian like got there pretty close to before you guys did it and everything. So you are you guys like the turnaround time of you, you know, specifically with the Bloody Bridget stuff, like like the live shows. Yeah. Or, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, the live shows. I mean, I I create everything myself. Uh, the costume, the props, you know, and I designed. I I do the choreography as well. So I've made this one, uh, the Bloody Bridget number specifically able to improvise because a lot of the time when we're touring um i'm lucky if i see the space right before the event you know so i have to be able to like improvise things and so um i mean brian doesn't come with us but i usually pick up like i'll you know have somebody involved with the film festival or my talent agent or something like that worst case i got rick if i need to <laughs> but um but yeah, so with Brian, when I use Brian, I mean, we see him like every week, we'll have like a, a fun dinner party, uh, you know, either at our place or at his place. But uh, he was totally game because he's also a, a producer on Bloody Bridget. So he loves the film. And we actually shot a few scenes, uh, big scenes at his house, which was wonderful. A little nerve wracking because I'm a huge fan of his. And so if you can imagine, like there's a part where I uh, kind of like kill a very naughty bad guy. Uh, and I run around his, uh, Brian Usna's house. And so uh, 
I'm like running around and every time I do a loop around chasing the bad guy, there's Brian Usna having a glass of wine with another friend, uh, John Petty, and like waving at me. And so it's like, <laughs> it's so surreal. <laughs> or he'll like pop up behind me off camera when I'm like going to like fight a bad guy or something. So it's just like, it's so, it's so weird, my life, you know? <laughs> but what a ride, man. Yeah, but Brian's very, he's like, on board and he loves this kind of like live performance he, he loves the kind of like wacky stuff that we do and i'm really easy to work with so it's like i just tell whoever the victim is you know that the, kind of the an idea of how the number goes and then i just trust that they're going to be safe and i'm going to be safe and we just go for it <laughs> that's it is really cool if you guys have bloody bridget coming in this fashion around you you guys ought to make it an effort to go see it because it does look really really rad um brian i'm sure would let you eat his heart out every every night if he was able to tour with you guys oh yes i know i know i want to do another like local screening to get him again because like isn't that wild like i don't know it's like for me it's like what i was doing i was like it's this real life like what is happening because he's a great he's like a very fun person and he was very into the performance because i always ask people to like i want drama like scream so the back can hear you call for help you know flail your arms and stuff because it only makes me better you know like i i, I want big big performances <laughs> for sure so with that man like you being an onstage performer, film performer now, uh, was that something that you knew? Because my dad always tells me, like, whatever job you had growing up, I knew you were meant to, like, do something to entertain people. Was entertainment something that you just kind of, like, as they say, was in your blood? Like, you felt like it was what you were destined to do? Oh, definitely. I mean, I grew up in the theater. I've been classically trained in ballet since I was three. So constantly performing and kind of like a little vaudeville lifestyle, you know, with like traveling for stuff. Um, and then the, the, the performing and everything. Um, yeah. Uh, and I did modeling and stuff. So it was always, that was just always kind of something that I, I knew that I could do. And Personally, I know it doesn't show right now, but personally, I'm a little shy. And so that gave me a reason, like a mask to be behind and a way to express myself, you know. So, yeah, I mean, and also like growing up, I would always put on like little plays, like very, very like specific plays, dress up, force my little sister to be a performer, you know, get the dog in on it too. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I actually, for a while, I um, I kind of gave acting up a little bit because I felt like I was going more towards like effects mm -hmm. and doing like creature effects and, and costuming and things like that. So I did that professionally for a while, but it's like, I love doing both. And so I missed being in front of the camera too much. So, you know, so then I kind of like let that go. And also like, I'm very sensitive. So the chemicals weren't great for me. <laughs> and I was having like reactions and stuff. And it's like, okay, that's not really worth it to me. I'd rather do it on my own. Cause like now it's like with these live performances and the acting that I do, I'm very involved. And so I create everything myself, you know, Mm -hmm. And that, so, so I'm not losing anything. <laughs> and that experience probably helps you a ton as far as staging all the all the stuff. Yeah, Where I mean, I came in with like a very like I don't know analytical mind. Like my brain works like that. I, I I okay. I have severe dyslexia, so I'm very creative and I can see things before making them, and so I and I can engineer things. And so I came with that. And so it was easier for people to teach me things, you know, and I definitely learned some stuff and I still use it today. <laughs> Very cool, man. The, the thing that you had mentioned to me too is that you are planning on voicing uh, 
one of the characters in Richard's book alongside his son. That's that's what right here. Right on. <laughs> yeah. So yes, I'm I'm gonna be voicing her. <laughs> So, so tell us what what is the the premise of that book that he well, wrote? Well, I mean, now I wish I had Rick to like <laughs> to talk about his book. <laughs> I didn't write it, but what I gather is that it's a Jewish vampire tale, and it's hilarious. And I got to um, obviously read it and prove it beforehand. We kind of work together on, on those kind of things. He's also doing a lot in animation and writing different like um, like adult animation shows and some kids shows. And so, you know, I, I get to, to read it first, which is fun. But with this one, um, it's a really, it's a wild horror tale about vampires. And it's like, it's so good. I had to quickly read through it, even though I wanted to like, Absorb just it. like yeah i wanted to drag it out just because the story was so good and it's so funny he's such a funny writer Is <laughs> the whole voice acting aspect now now you've you've kind of like conquered the three tiers man the voice <laughs> acting the stage acting and the film acting it's pretty cool the trifecta what's left i guess i gotta get singing together <laughs> <laughs> outside of the shower right yeah <laughs> and there i've got i'm winning grammys <laughs> <laughs> you could be an ego winner man oh i mean that's the dream i guess <laughs> i don't know i'm not sure if any of my performances will be like acknowledged by any kind of academies or anything <laughs> i'm in the like the deep underground you know we do it for the art. <laughs> uh, hey, that thus is the independent artist. That is, that is the mantra of I think indie, especially indie horror. And it's interesting that you said that you're you're kind of a shy person, because I'll tell you what, all the people that I have met, especially uh, mass killers, like Kane Hodder, or C.J. Graham, or um, you know, Ken Kersinger, like all the big dudes in horror genres are pretty like either shy or very, very low key when you're talking to them. And they all kind of share the same sentiment, which is like the horror, like when you flip that switch and you're playing that character, it's almost like therapeutic because you're you're exerting this energy in a fashion that you normally wouldn't in your day-to-day -day life. Do you find that that's kind of the same for you? Oh, completely. I mean, here's the thing. It's like, I always tell people, it's like Richard and I, we have such like wild public personas, like these party people, these wild, crazy uh, creators, but like, at home, our home life, we're like such like homebodies, we're family people, you know, like we just want to stay home and watch movies and like Seinfeld and things like that. It takes a lot for us to go to an event because like we just love hanging out together with the family, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and I definitely like, you know, like if somebody spots me or like a friend spots me when I'm out and about, I'm like, oh, God, you know, like, I don't want to talk to anybody right now. Yeah. But so I'm definitely like the razzle dazzle is definitely for like the screen, you know, and I totally agree with that statement that it's like a, a sense of like therapy. I mean, it, it, it's almost like what Lon Chaney Sr. said. It's like there is no Lon Chaney uh in between films you know what i mean mm -hmm. like it's all about just the art you know but yeah i mean also like with the because my favorite parts are where i'm like a twist villain and i end up being like a demon or like a ghost or something like that because yeah. it's like i don't know i find those parts especially like in horror there's fun exciting parts for women in horror like i'm not finding these kind of like i'm not very excited by like a lot of the drama stuff. Yeah, i don't know like i don't like being sad i don't you know like i recently 
the first time in a while that I wasn't the bad guy, I was like the like quote unquote hero in a movie, uh, Pool Party Massacre 2. And it was so exhausting not to be the bad guy and to be like panicked all the time. And I was like, oh, can I just like switch over and be the bad guy? <laughs> yeah. It, it <laughs> reminds me. I, I, know, I take it for granted that like that kind of energy comes naturally when I'm playing pretend. You know what I mean? Hundred percent. It just what you just said there reminds me of. Uh, I'm a huge lifelong professional wrestling fan, and all the wrestlers, like in documentaries, behind the scenes stuff, they always say that it's hundred percent harder to be the good guy than it is the bad guy. It's so and, exhausting. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, you also, you, know, you had mentioned him, but I know you have a deep love for uh, Lon Chaney. Yeah, what, I do. What, what was it? What was like the first movie of his that you saw? Was it Love at First Sight? Was it, <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, what, he's a babe. <laughs> <laughs> like what um, got you hooked on him? Yeah, okay. Well, like a little bit about me. Uh, both of my parents were uh, career Marines, so very regimented and stern and um, very focused people. And so I, it, it, it's kind of like they turned like quasi like hippies as I was growing up. So I wasn't allowed to like play video games. And so I had this great exposure to like silent films and growing up on silent films, classic films. Uh, when I look back, it's like a lot of pre-code horror, a lot of the important horror films I was exposed to very early on. And so i have just obsessed with like film history and especially horror history. That's like a big obsession of mine and what I like to share with people because um, I love talking about it. Mm -hmm. uh, but with Lon, I mean, I, I believe my first film was his 1925 Phantom of the Opera. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so I fell in love with his performances. I mean, he, he emotes so much with, I mean, like literally never saying a word. And most of that film, he's a shadow. He yeah. just hands on a wall, you know, or flinging like a, like a threatening envelope at people, you know, like I'm going to murder you. Right. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, after after falling in love with him as, as an, a creator, I did more research and I found out that we both share the same birthday, April 1st. Oh. So that's wild. And, uh, you know, I, I, I mentioned like I have severe dyslexia. Both of his parents were um, deaf mutes and he didn't learn how to, he, he didn't have a need to talk until he was like four years old. And so he dealt with that kind of like, Dis discrimination from like the townspeople and stuff like that um you know like calling his like his dad it's like a little history lesson on lawn i don't know if we have time oh no, yeah no yeah he, he his dad was like the head barber in colorado in like like I, I forget what town in colorado i think colorado springs and so he was the head barber and stuff and there's like people would call him like dummy cheney and things like that but at a certain point his mom had some big health issues where she ended up bedridden. And so that like had Lon um, like gather up information and give her like these little kind of like newspaper plays where he would physically act out like what would happen in town, you know? And so that helped his pantomiming and everything like that. But anyways, like, so, I just feel a connection with him just naturally. And then also I'm very inspired by how inclusive he is, like with, um, you know, including like different, um, like sign language into his performances, like in Hunchback, you, you can see things like in Phantom uh, that like, you know, somebody who's deaf would be able to, to understand like the, the, the movement for hate or love, you know what I mean? And so back then that's just like, for me, it's so ahead of, it's time to think that way. You know what I mean? Sure. Yeah. And then, I mean, that's just the acting, let alone how radical he was and groundbreaking uh, with his makeup effects. You know, yeah. like he was literally designing 
like how we look at horror and like what could be achieved and and you know makeup effects and creating those jobs because there wasn't a union for for makeup artists i mean most back then the most um actors were doing their own makeup and following a guide that like the movie stu studios would tell them oh use greens use this like that gets like translated better onto the black and white film you know and so he was just like breaking barriers and to me he is the father of horror so <laughs> i mean he really he really was man phantom phantom really was kind of the the match thrown into the kindling for all those those great monster movies to to come down the pipeline now i know you're not you're saying that you, you know you don't want people really like coming and if you're not in the mood for it or anything but I'm gonna... <laughs> well i'm always very kind and welcoming it's just oh, for like, sure i don't know like me in my like sweats and a graphic shirt i don't know how fun it is for anybody i'm just like trying to get a, i don't know some coffee from whole food you know like i don't know no you i'm, I'm a little you, awkward in person so you absolutely can be an introverted sweetheart anastasia there's no oh, problem with that like thank you. but what i was going to tell you is that this year in specific uh real close to your house over there universal they are doing Halloween Horror Nights like they do every year, but something that you would appreciate. They are doing in one of their houses in the soundstage that filmed a huge percentage of the horror, Universal Horror Monster movies. Okay. And, and it is a Universal Monsters haunted house. And it is the story of it. They have been doing this thing over the course of like three, four years that the Bride of Frankenstein, you know, imagine she survives the castle crumbling at the end of the movie. And the first year that they did it, the opening scene is literally her trying to lift rubble off of Frankenstein. And she uh, discovers that the way to reanimate him is the Bride of Dracula's blood. Okay. And so, <laughs> so three, four years ago, you know, the end, the end is... You know, she pumps him full of his blood, and then the guy who is Frankenstein reanimates and goes after you. So fast forward as this story has progressed, they've done a good job of like showing her doing these different things. And it kind of right now in that sound stage is uh, Van Helsing's granddaughter is coming after Dracula's daughter, and along the way comes across the bride. And they team up to take on uh, She Wolf and the female mummy. But it's all taking place in the soundstage where they filmed the majority of these movies. Uh, it, it is pretty cool, like to see that kind of stuff. That and sounds being, incredible. Yeah. So you got a week to, to go out there if you want to <laughs> see it. <laughs> but, yeah. Yes. Okay. Now I have to go. <laughs> My that. sister's like visiting from out of town because she lives in uh in Oregon and so she wanted to go to to Universal Studios, which is like right down the street from us because we're underneath the Hollywood sign. I think mm -hmm. last time we we I was on your show, we were like on a roof deck. <laughs> you were, yeah. 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 yeah so that's just that's a quick like, I don't know, five minute drive for me. So yes, I have now I have to go. <laughs> you guys um with bloody bridget do you guys think that that is a film franchise that you would possibly bring back down the line would bridget make a resurface at some point well hell yeah like i think she is such a great crazy role model you know like i've had so many women come up to me like forget about the dude sorry but like women are like she is so kick ass i need her to take care of some people for me you know and like wanting telling me that they're gonna dress up for as her for halloween or whatever so i think i think it's a great idea to continue i mean there's always naughty people I mean, I'm not like Bloody Bridget. Bridget isn't just after men. Like, there's naughty women out there. Oh yeah, sure. And there's anybody and everybody. If you're naughty, watch out because she's gonna get you. <laughs> <laughs> and 
we're also working on kind of trying to expand the universe. Rick and I are working on a really cool um, show for Bloody Bridget and kind of like pulling in some of my loves. I love horror, obviously. I love talking about like physical media and films that I like know a lot about and love. And I've kind of like, pitched an idea to Rick about like kind of making like maybe like an Elvira meets uh the Crypt Keeper meets a little goopiness of Kiwi, you know, like just talking about the films that I love and making it fun for everybody and exposing people to films that are important to me and that I feel like don't have enough eyes on them, you know? For so sure. we're like working on something fun. But it's like Bloody Bridget uh, theme sure. and the character, you know. So yeah. I, I would love her to be another like midnight host type of thing, you know. Yeah, that'd be super rad to be able to, like you're saying, expose people to these movies. It was, it's interesting that you say that kind of thing, expose people to the movies that they may not even know exist. Just for shits and giggles the other day, I was like, what movies because facebook loves to pull stuff if it's copyright about uh uh you know you're you're doing the copyright thing and uh so i was like i wonder like if you could set up like a screening like a live screening with like a live group of people on facebook so what movies are royalty free and the horror movies that are royalty free like the old classics i was like shocked that some of them are royalty free um whether or not you know you guys pay for royalties or not, but those movies are just kind of sitting there, and you you know you touched on your love of physical media. Yes, we are. Yes, <laughs> we are in like in this weird, fluctuant age of like Targets and WalMarts and video stores like pulling their physical media, which is kind of disheartening to see. For the for the sake of digital, because man, like you guys are gonna be all upset if something happens and you can't stream and you don't have any physical media to pop into a DVD player or a Blu-ray player. I what know. what is your? Uh, do you have like a couple of like certain pieces in your collection that are your faves? Yeah, I mean, I just got. I brought it down here just in case you were going to ask because I was like, I talk about physical media too much not to be asked these things. I'm really loving um, this release of Todd Browning's um, huh. like three three works by him by uh, Criterion. And it's so, it's like such a loving box set and so worth, you know, the, the money to, to me. Um, just like this little pamphlet that comes in it alone, it's just like stock full of really interesting um, information, you know, because like we've got Todd Browning's uh, Freaks, The Unknown, and then The Mystic, which was thought to be lost. And it was just uh, mislabeled in some French vault. So it was lost for like decades and they just found it. So it's it's pretty crazy, but this one so far is my favorite. I mean, I don't know. We have so many films, so I don't I don't know how to answer that other than just like <laughs> talking about that one. How about you? What's Man, your favorite? My favorite piece of physical media would probably be can't go grab it now because it's in the other room. But it is this. <laughs> I love like with a passion the way that you you talk about lawn. I talk about Alfred Hitchcock. Oh, so good. So good. And he came out, it's probably been five or six years ago, but it is a like red velvet box oh. with his silhouette on it. And then it has, it's not his complete works, but it's pretty close. And it's like five steel books in the box that are like from just spitballing like 55 to 65. This is what he did. And then, you know, so forth and so on. And it is really cool. There's movies. It, it was cool to get because it exposed me to some of his earlier stuff. Cause you know, the vast majority of people, you know, Hitchcock, it's 
Psycho, the birds, Vertigo. Um, oh, yeah. And, and this has got, you know, everything from uh, North by Northwest to, you know, uh, of course, Rear, Rear Window, which I love, you know, with being, you know, on the indie level, budgetary wise, Rear Window is one of those films that you look at coming out of film school and you're like, I can see exactly how he did that movie. And it is perfect the way that he did it. Cause it is like, it's almost, you know, coming from a theater background, it's like a black box stage. Cause it's just that looking out that window at that other apartment complex. And then his apartment, of course, but what you could, what he was able to accumulate out of that film with just, a really simplistic set is pretty, pretty special. No, it's radical. Like if you look at, if you were just to kind of try to describe uh, the basic plot points, like injured guy stuck in uh, in an apartment, uh, maybe witnesses a murder. And you're like, I don't know about this. How good could it be? But like, it's so crazy how he created outside of that, box you know i mean it's so it it's so delicious and it's so in depth just everything and obviously the camera work the lighting you know we've got gorgeous gorgeous um you know wardrobe and dresses you know yeah. to fawn yeah. over <laughs> with you guys um doing the appearances all over the world really like <laughs> is there is there a spot that you know you would love to travel to that you haven't solely to screen and do your bloody bridget is there an audience you know paris germany spain like where where would you if you could like just say like anastasia we are going this week we're going to do the Bloody Bridget show, screen it. Where do you want to go? Oh, wow. I would love that. Um, <laughs> yeah, yes to all of those places. I think I could really get away with a lot of fun, like in, in Germany, you know? Uh, yeah, I mean, I would love to go to, to England and do something. I mean, I don't know. It's like we keep on getting these requests for like film festivals and it's so hard to say no. It's just too much fun. And I love I love supporting all of these like festivals because a lot of them are like smaller indie ones. And that's who I like to support, like indie horror creators and events. Um, yeah. At some point, we'll have to like buckle down and and release her, I guess. <laughs> I do another version of this, you know, so sure. the, a different type of road show. But we just, I, I don't know. It's it's been so thrilling to get like to watch because usually I don't watch my own stuff. I don't I don't like watching my own films or anything just because I'm like it value for me, you know, like I, I think I did a good job, but also I'm like awkward. But I've really enjoyed watching Bloody Bridget with an audience because it's like these people have such big reactions to like getting the hearts ripped out. And then obviously we have an incredible new original score from Dan, my brother-in-law, Danny Elfman, and our friend and constant collaborator, uh, Ego Plum, who does like Spongebob and Cuphead <laughs> show, you know, like we've got like a massive like million dollar score and we have wonderful uh, like practical effects from uh, Soda and then we have um, wonderful VFX from our friend uh, Kevin Kuchever who is like this incredible artist and he's worked on like everything that you love, like, like, well, that I love Robocop, Gremlins, Beetlejuice. Uh, it's like, what hasn't he worked on? So we're so lucky to have these like incredible artists, like supporting us, you know, and, and helping us make this, this film so wild and insane. <laughs> the fact that you hit the nail on the head, cause I think modern horror right now, is a the the way to do it is how you guys did it where it is the blend of practical and vfx and 
not leaning too heavily because I think that's one thing that I will say that some filmmakers will do now with all this, the digital tools available to them, they lean, you know, real heavy on the digital and it loses the magic, especially horror. Um, Horror will always be home to practical effects, I feel like. Like the more practical effects, the better, so much so that when you listen to like, um, like just, I mean, you said it in the list of the, the, the crew that you had on the films, Beetlejuice, listening to, you know, Tim Burton commentary on that, on the Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice disc. Um, like you, you could tell, like if they told him, Tim, um, we're going to need you to go more digital with this. He probably wouldn't have done it. Like, it's like practical effects in the horror genre are a match made in heaven. Yes, I mean, completely agree. I have very strong and big opinions on uh, practical effects and the use or non-use in um, especially newer horror films. I mean, I would have done way more practical on Bloody Bridget, but it was like a completely self-financed indie uh, project. And so, you know, we didn't have the time to make every little thing, but luckily we you know, like there was definitely a blend that we were able to do and satisfy my love of practical effects and then, you know, make it look even better with Kevin's brilliant eye, you know, just like blown. There's moments where uh, rooms are blowing away, like walls and stuff, and we're in a different dimension, like Bloody Bridget's uh, kind of demonic dimension right. yeah. which is like so insane and wonderful and there's like a wonderful like hellscape musical number at the end um but yeah i i i feel like i mean not to get too deep into it because i do have like long big opinions but it's like i i feel like what made the classic horror films the like practical effects driven films that we love was that they were the creators were given enough prep time and then left alone to like do the effects you know i'm talking about like uh uh what's that american werewolf in in london you know uh all the gremlin stuff uh uh wolf you know you know like all of these like very uh death becomes or all of these very practical of effects driven films and it's like i feel like now everybody especially like the suits in hollywood who are like controlling the budgets um not to make enemies but i feel like everybody's trying to like shoot faster shoot faster yeah we can do cgi on this but it's like no like what made them special you know was either a mix or like practical you know what i mean and like for deep horror fans like ourselves it's like those things matter and i feel like once like the suits in Hollywood realize how much of a difference. I mean, just look at like what's going on with Terrifier right now. Like they're so practical effects driven and massive amounts of horror fans are coming to support. And that's what we want. We want these films and not just during Halloween. Like for me, like Halloween is a lifestyle. I want to watch a scary movie every single night, you know? And I want to go to the movies like and watch a new horror film every weekend you know so it's like there's definitely the audience and i hate like when i hear like these big creators say that like oh no like it's only during halloween time like no like we want to watch new stuff all the time (laughs) or at least me because i'm a huge fan (laughs) no i 100 percent agree with you there are our state theater historical theater downtown for a while we were doing like at least monthly late night shows where we do trivia and, you know, podcasts in the lobby with whoever was showing up, like come sit down at our table, be on our podcast, tell us what your favorite movies are. And there was a community there. And then the new owner, again, not to make enemies. (laughs) I know. I always have to be careful. I don't know who's watching this. (laughs) And, And it was like, but he pretty much said like exactly what you were saying, like how some people will think like, well, you know, there's not really an audience for that in May. And it's like, no, there's an audience for that in May. Like, trust me, like, we are around. And 2024 has been a very good year for horror. Like, 
I think like we gotta like keep it up, everybody listening, watching, and like let the cinematic world know that like the horror because growing up, like horror was like the stepchild that you kept in the in the bedroom when the when the <laughs> business partners came over for a dinner, like stay in your room, don't come out. You're gonna embarrass, <laughs> you're gonna embarrass us. And it's like, no, no more, man. Like horror is a prominent community we're like the one i would say horror fans are like that one community that don't bicker at each other either like the more wow. like the most family oriented genre fans are horror fans no um, i exactly i mean i feel like we've cultivated this wonderful like horror family and you're part of it and it's like whenever like Rick and I have a project or something, I feel like I have so much support to try to get the word out there to like the rest of the horror community. Cause you know, it's like, it's big, but it's also small, you know? So it, it, I, I feel like we definitely, like in the community, we definitely support creators and we want everybody to succeed. Cause like, we're like the, like you said, the like unwanted stepchild, you know, just like trying to make it work in, in a broom closet, you know, with like right. restrictions and <laughs> right. Yeah, that the terrifier, it is pretty wild if you go back and you watch All Hollows Eve or Terrifier One, specifically Terrifier One, because that's like when Damien was really running with the with the ball, so to speak. To now, it is crazy to see the evolution of that franchise. And uh, David, I've been lucky enough to get to hang out with him a few times. He is such a humble dude, and he is such like a he's really a pretty quiet guy too. But man, kind of similar to how you were talking, like the second that you call action, or the second that he's on, you know, stage, you know, whether it be at a con or whatever but that, that switch flips and that art grin comes on and like it's <laughs> it's showtime man it it really is that is something that you know yourself and a lot of the actors actresses even directors that i've gotten to interview it, you guys are all in that vein of flip the switch and let's mess some stuff up it's it's funny to see and it's cool to be able to to flip the switch the opposite direction and just chill out and yeah. en enjoy conversations like these and know that the the love is there because we all, you know, for the most part, I think, grew up with these movies. And we definitely, I mean, speaking for myself, but speaking for everybody watching, listening, we will be eagerly awaiting whatever it is that you guys got next in the pipeline. So where can everybody follow you, uh, uh, you slash you and Richard? Because I know you got your know, we're kind of a partnership, aren't yeah. we? <laughs> Which um, is great. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, we're both on Facebook and Instagram the most. So Anastasia Elfman and Richard Elfman on Facebook. And then I'm a little tricky right now until I can figure out how to switch it. Uh, so I, on Instagram, I'm under my stage name, Dahlia DeMont. But once I can figure out how to switch it to my name and not like lose it, <laughs> I will. Yeah. Um, so Dahlia DeMont on Instagram and Richard Elfman on Instagram. And then our, our, our films all have their own pages too. And we're like very, easy to connect with and uh we post a lot about our upcoming projects or um where we're gonna be or screening events things like that you know so yeah <laughs> uh, well everybody go out there if you haven't had a chance to check it out definitely check out bloody bridget check out you know imbd both anastasia and richard and check out their stuff man because if you are a horror fan there's zero doubt in my mind you will enjoy what they are putting together for you guys. And that's really what it boils down to. They do it because they love it, but they do it because they want you guys to love it too and enjoy everything that encapsulates 
being a horror fan. Thank you so much for this conversation and coming on again. Yes, thank you. Thank you for giving me this platform to just like obsess and talk about all of my different obsessions and favorite things. You are so kind and have been such like a su huge supporter for us. And I so appreciate it, you know, being able to come and chat with you. Love doing it. Yeah. <laughs> and we will absolutely have to do it again. Yes, just let me know. Absolutely. <laughs>